today um, I'll be working on this cedar, uh, blue cedar. This is a tree that was grown by Harm, um, a bark nursery bear. It's, it's obviously it's had a fair amount of work to this stage already. It's got, you know, it's got deadwood developing. Um, it's already had a lot of the branches and heavy bending done on it. This, this first branch in particular is bent down nicely. Um, and it's, it's sort of, like I said, it's, it's not material, it's not finished bonsai, but it's somewhere in between on that scale. So it's actually really nice to be working on the material at this level that's not necessarily rough stock, not necessarily finished bonsai, because I think it's, it's quite easy to come across this sort of quality material in Australia. There's some really good growers, and I was one of them. Um, and so to get material like this, you can actually take it to the the next level very easily because all bones are supported there. So tonight I haven't had much of a chance to really look at it. Um, a quick look um, earlier on. Essentially I'll be trying to cut a lot of this back and massage it into shape. I'm thinking probably the front will be through where you guys are sitting on one we'll sort of flesh that out as I prune a bit more. And that's often the case in the way that I often work is I don't tend to set a plan up from the start. I will more likely prune and um, work my way through the tree. And usually that starts to reveal um, which direction the tree wants to move. Um, I'm going to pinch it. Where is that extruded plastic bonsai stand? I'll just get it up a bit higher. Okay. Right. 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 So. First of all, this tree's obviously been let grow, so it's got all these long um, extended shoots. And this is good, this is a sign of health. Tree growing out, it's extending, it's obviously got a lot of momentum um, and a lot of vigor sort of inherently in the, uh, within the tree itself. Um, I can almost, without thinking too much, start to cut these back without really having an idea of what I'm going to do with the tree. Um, you know, this is the apex, we also don't want really long branches there, so I can just immediately start looking into these. Um, these upper areas and looking for opportunities to cut back to them. So I'm going to do a rough pass first and then probably go through and do a, a second pass a bit more carefully. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just looking to cut back these shoots to essentially sub branches that can form a new continuation of the branch line. So essentially cutting back thick, thick tips, or thick growth of the tips of the branches, but cutting them back to thinner growth uh, a little bit closer into the canopy, which Essentially, gives you more branch taper, and of course, pushes in the uh, uh, what's the word? pushes in the the outline of the canopy into more in line with the scale of what the tree should be looking like. So, I'm starting at the top in this instance, and I'm <coughs> cutting, cutting my way down, and it's placing because the top the <coughs> should be essentially the least wide section of the tree, and then the tree should get wider going down. And that's, I mean, that's reasons from a styling perspective, but also from just a horticultural perspective. Obviously, if the upper part of the tree is shading the lower part, um, you're going to end up with issues in balance there as far as growth didn't low down, becoming shaded out, and then becoming weak. Um, as I'm going, so I'm going to try to and normally, demos can sometimes give a bit of a, uh, what's the word, a sort of false impression of um, how it takes to live on You know, most demonstrations, at least in this country, run for a couple of hours, something like that. And the reality is to, to do a tree of this size, which is by no means a big tree with a lot of foliage, I mean, this might be a six hour exercise or something like that for a tree that size, for something bigger, um, to do it. Correctly and give the time it deserves, you know, it might be, you know, it's not uncommon for 8 hours, 12 hours, something like that. Um, I've got a pine sitting in my place at the moment that I'm working on for someone, and I'm sort of three quarters away through pulling the wire off and pulling needles, and thus far I've spent six hours on just pulling needles and um, pulling off wire. So it's demonstrations are always a bit of a rush in that regard. Um, and I think the reality is you should, you should probably be working a bit more slowly if the trees are coming. Um, I'm just going to slow a bit. Pay more attention, I suppose. 
I know. It was only your first glance at Joe, but what made you think the, up, the side you're looking at now might be the front? Um, that's a good question. So, essentially, the, I usually I'll start at the roots, and I guess the, I like to break things down in my own head as, into component parts and sort of weigh them up individually if that makes sense. Often I'll look at a tree and sometimes we'll go back and this is what I want to do. If that's not the case, and this, this tree was, uh, not that it was unclear, but with all this growth on it, it's a little, um, it's a little it's confusing or difficult to sort of immediately see what direction it might go or what, or, or more to the point, be able to rule out all other directions in, in a single glance. So when I was looking at it, I looked at the roots, and I think from this side, I'll give you guys a little bit of a, a tour on this wonky turntable. Um, the roots from this side are good. Um, you know, particularly from some of these angles, they thin out. The back is not bad, but not as good. Again, that side's less grey. So, so, from a root perspective, this, this side's telling me that it's um, worth pursuing. But these are dead woods of immediate sort of no brain that from this side it's, it's a potential feature and from that side it's the most visible. Even from the direct opposite side you're only getting glances of it poking through the foliage and from behind the trunk. Um, the branch structure as well. Um, while this is a front isn't bad, this, the first branch that comes from a little bit behind but it's, it's in a pretty good position. Um, I think from this side I like the way it comes out of the trunk. And it means that the thinner of the branches becomes would be sitting to the back and create some depth there. Whereas the other way around, you'd have to deal with this branch in the front, so you'll either have to come very short or get cut off. So, you know, you start to work your way through the tree, and through this sort of decision making process, you can sort of come up with this is a possible front. And like I said, I guess at the start, that Sometimes I'll do that and I'll make that sort of snap decision, so this will be the front, but also as I'm cleaning up and working my way through the, the structure and capture and those kinds of things, um, I'll actually come to a different conclusion and the feature that I haven't been able to see very clearly, um, you know, or, or something like that that reveals itself when you're doing this sort of clean up phase. And I think one of the, one of the key things that I advise people to do um, in their own trees, and, I do a fair bit of teaching now, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people tell me, oh, I've got this tree and I don't know where to start. What am I going to do with it? And what are the plans that can come? And often, I mean, I, I'll often work on trees that I have no idea what to do with them, and I'll work on other people's trees as well, so you get broad things that you're not familiar with. Um, and, you know, short of leaving the garden and watering it every day for a year to sort of get to know it, um, a really good way to start is just to start doing something you know you can do. You know, Plant the foliage, remove the dead branches, you can um, start pruning out the faulty um, structure in the, the tree, you know, thick upright branches, or, or you know, a really dumb, it's a very easy way to start pruning is the exterior of the canopy should be fine. So if you've got thick bits of growth in the exterior part of the canopy, you can immediately go and start looking to cut them out and replace them with finer growth closer into the tree. So by simply starting doing tasks that are not necessarily to do with the style, then you can actually start to develop an idea of what the tree might become. So, I'm doing a bit of that now. I'm going through cutting out bits of funny bits of branch structure, um, growth that's not ideal, and by that I mean stuff that's growing up or down or um, some other odd direction that's not going to be used. And essentially, just trying to clean up these areas of foliage into a sort of form that will be easy to wire, so it's a clear path for the wire to follow, um, as well as um, as well as basically all the not just effective but the less ideal branch structure that I'm not going to use can be cut off. So not so wiring things that I don't need to wire if that makes sense. Joe, yeah, you you've worked in Japan. Yeah. Um, when I look at a lot of the albums from Japan, I don't see many cedars. Do they not like growing, or do they not have access to them? Um, 
I've got a couple of old albums that have got, I think there's, in, yeah, there's a couple of years that have trees in the clock for 10 that are seen up. Okay. But that's all I've ever seen. And you don't see, like, the Japanese grow a lot of trees that you don't necessarily see at exhibition, that you see just in random nurseries are weird. They grow some interesting to me, <coughs> and a few other things that I don't make particularly great ones, I don't have great traits. But, um, yeah, they, you sometimes see them, or see them, you never actually come across them. And I, my, I guess my reading to that is that in a country where you've got access to white pine, which has a really nice needle quality, um, you know, it, it's very well suited to bonsai culture. Um, you know, you don't. I don't think you need to grow something like a cedar, which cedar make really nice bonsai. They have really good needles. They uh, they're very flexible. Um, but one of the inherent problems with that flexibility is they often will will wire and they'll spring back to where they were. And so I think if you can. Um, What's the word? If you can have a species that behaves in a similar way that actually has better features, so in that, you know, white pine is, um, uh, is able to set in place and stay in place a lot better, um, why wouldn't you grow that into the, the seed? That's my guess is that white pine is just superior um, in a lot of ways to seed it. That's why you don't see it. You also don't see much. <laughs> ever, which is interesting. The Japanese larch is quite beautiful, small variety, but obviously in Europe they use it a fair bit. But I think maybe when you, it's it's another really interesting conversational point, if you like, where um, this idea that you shouldn't necessarily grow everything, that there are, there are going to be species that are more suited and less suited to one side than others, um, you know, they will or won't tolerate various. Um, you're not talking about Australian natives, are you? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think anything. I think Australian natives are certain ones, but there are, if you look at the, the Japanese common bonsai species, you know, they've actually got a huge range of species that you see in forests that are never grown as bonsai. And you know, Australian natives might be an example, but also, I mean, many of the you know, garden trees and things like that you see around here, you know, European gardens or European gardens in Australia and don't necessarily make great bonsai. Either. And I think it's probably a uh, I'm a sort of believer that you should grow things that are going to do what you want. And because of the time frames that you have to invest in, in doing bonsai, um, you know, we might have trees that are 30 years old or more. Um, I, I would suggest that you invest that time in trees that are providing results rather than trees that are going to sort of battle you the whole, the whole way. Makes sense. The same would go for Australian natives. There are, there's a number of species that are tried and tested and true that, that make excellent candidates for bonsai that tolerate all the, um, tolerate all the things that get done to them uh, during their life of bonsai. Um, and then there are species that, that don't, that are not necessarily an Australian native, but the, the New Zealand Christmas tree, the Christmas bush, can make very cute little bonsai. There's a guy in WA. Called CJ, and he he grows them, but he loses a lot um, when he bring pots. All he does is basically pulls them out and up up pots them into the next size pot. Doesn't really touch the roots, um, you know. And then and then some years he just loses a number of them for no real reason. He doesn't really change much. And other years he I mean that that's heartbreaking. What's like growing to be you know dealing with a species like that? But you know they're, they're very very pretty. They've got a lovely small flower, etc. Uh, etc. Et but You've got to ask yourself if you're investing the time that you do to grow bonsai, whether that's, that's actually worth it or not. Same would go for Australian native. You know, certainly, some of the eucalypts are excellent, others are probably to be avoided you know, for various reasons. And while we're at, you know, Australian native bonsai, still, I guess it's, you know, it's early days somewhat. Um, People have been playing with it for a number of years, but there's still species out there that have been tried and tested. And I think it's certainly worth doing those experiments on things that, you haven't, that other people haven't already provided feedback on. Or, uh, but I think you've also got to be prepared that you know you get hit limits occasionally that aren't going to work for you. Yeah. 
this the East Bay, I don't know if it's the Australian Native plant is a bonsai, it's like a male group. Remember that? It's like a little male, the Canberra bonsai, Native bonsai. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was like a male, yeah, it's sort of yeah. male in and they catalog stuff and whatnot, and it's a little music over it. Yeah, but in some of those brief articles in there about certain, you know, obscure Australian Native species, and that's how I've been growing for a number of years, and blah, blah, blah. It's been a really good species provided you don't break the product, you don't feed it nitrogen. <laughs> And you can't wire up the one bed for it. You know, this had this list of sort of um, this exceptions that you couldn't apply to it. But I'd kind of say, well, that's the red flag there telling you that it's not suitable for what's like. You can get it to survive um, and whatnot. But the reality is that they're not going to tolerate the, uh, the range of things that need to be done in order for it to be good and a whole lot of it's sustainable in sort of long term sense. Can I ask with your um, wiring technique why you've got the ends? You've got the ends? So, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> aesthetics? It's like, no, it's not trying to break my eye. Oh, it's just that. I just haven't Yeah, no, that's not a no secret technique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, so. I'm trying to make this not so much just an exercise of watching the wire, but there will be a. Nice to a little. Um, this first branch, while well, it's been bent down really nicely, the tips now started to grow up, and that's another trait of cedars and many other species that grow up. In sort of cedar, they'll be very slow, like the, you know, the length of the length of these extensions tell me that they, they're strong growers when they want to be. Um, often in those strong growing um, species, they'll tend to start to, you know, all the tips will turn up and then as they start to grow up, they'll actually leave the branches up a little bit. Figs will do it a little bit as well. You often see these big, particularly big old figs, they've got big, thick first branches. These are branches that were down like this originally and they're, they're sort of now you know, pointing upwards and they, it's this sort of slow creep that they do. Um, the cedars are sort of, will do that a lot and perhaps that's what's happened branches have come around and sort of push itself up. So I'm just going to try and correct that with a wire that's twitching down. And this is, twitches are a really good, really good technique. Because you can sort of get away with using less large wire, which particularly in aluminium, it's a complete pain I find putting on, you know, four, you know, three and a half plus millimeter brand, uh, wires. They are, they're hard to manipulate. They take up a lot of sort of branch real estate, if you like. So they actually occupy. They look chunky. They occupy a lot of sort of visual space on the branch. Um, um, and yeah, it's just generally kind of annoying to use it. And then when you're buying the big stuff, you know, you go through it. It's so thick you get about three wraps per kilo. And um, as a result, you actually chew through it really quickly. Beauty is of copper wire is you can get a lot, you know, for a four mil wire in aluminium, you might get away with half or, or less the diameter in copper to do the same job. So in that way, you're actually able to um, grab get the bedding done for a lot less of um, a lot less length and weight, and, um, and also it's a lot less um, conspicuous as far as the wiring job. So you don't end up with um, all this really obvious masses of heavy wires up and down the branches of the trunk. But copper can be hard to come by. And that's where I use a lot of twitches. So I'll, I've got very little really large wire at home. I've got a few rolls because there are some, some things you just can't get away without using it. But for the most part I'll set up twitches. Um, and you know, by a twitch I mean you know, essentially a die wire that's connected to something. And, uh, then goes up and attaches to the branch, and as you bend it down, you tighten that wire and it sort of takes up the slack. Um, if I don't have attachment points for a long, if I want to bend the, the head over or something, I would probably leave all the wire in a metal bar or something like that into the trunk, using a twitch before I would use a really 
or multiple heavy lines. Obviously, if it's just a couple of your own, but um, sometimes, particularly out there, you've got double and triple it all up, and it's just it's, it's a bit much. So, we get them through them. Is there one of those seeders? Has anyone got those seeders? Yeah, okay. You can choose to work, you know, they'll, they'll, um, they'll uh, you know, form into good, good looking trees in a fairly short period of time because they're quite fierce growers. When they get old, and there's an old one over there that we sort of started to rework, um, it's out in that corner there. It's, it's a tree that was a little bit weak and it's come back into strength. It's dropped a couple of branches um, during its period of. Weakness, if you like, that's coming back. But if you have a look at the bark on that, you know, this tree is just starting to crackle, but it's predominantly fairly smooth. But cedars can get some really aggressive crackling bark, you know, almost rivaling, almost, it's almost a finer scale in a lot of ways than a, an old black pine. It's a really good looking old, crackly, nice, nice bark that um, is certainly a feature of the um, film if you've got a cedar. Obviously, it's just been a way more than a time for the record. Alright, so... I've always got this first branch done, but I can see what's the next one on. Talk a little bit more about what, I'm, what I've been doing here. And how I'm going about wiring. So, wiring is one of those... I often hear people talking about how they dislike wiring. And Perhaps you've chosen the wrong hobby if you're not into fine. This is more essentially, you know, it's, it's the paintbrush of the painter, it's the, uh, whatever, it's the nail gun of the carpenter, it's, you know, it's, it is your, it's the tool for shaping and creating, you know, the style of, of any tree. Mm -hmm. like it's, I can, I can understand why people see it as the tiresome chore sort of thing. It takes, it can take a long time, you know, like, Wiring a, wiring a big tree fully out to every tip. You know, that could be a two day exercise, like two days and two full days, you know, from you know, nine to five, nine to five. Um, and you might still not be done, you might take another day to finish it. So there's, you know, there's a lot of time, and obviously as your trees, I'll talk about that in a minute, but as your trees develop, they get, you know, the amount of work they demand sort of increases exponentially. But wiring is a really, really important skill to master. That's, I find incredibly satisfying. Um, both doing it, but also the results that you get from it. So, you, know, you get these really dramatic transformations um, in a very short period of time from really what I think is a, it's, I find it a very relaxing, I want to call it a pursuit, because no one no wants to be a white wall type stuff, you know, to do all the other bits with it. But it's, it's, you know, it's essentially like a bit of a, it's a problem solving exercise at, at, the, at its base. It's to, to do a good job, so, and by a good job, I mean, you know, neat wiring, why is that not crossing? Why is that the right size for the right branch? Why is that, um, uh, you know, applied well, that change down sizes as the branch narrows, all these things to do that, you know, well and efficiently is very, it's quite, it is, it's difficult. But it's quite often like quite an interesting challenge, and it's something that you've got to really sort of think through as you're doing it, and plan ahead a little bit in order to, um, really get a good job. Okay. It's, it's sort of, so the first branch starting to, starting to appear, yeah. um, at the wide there. And make a couple of sun pads, haven't decided if you pick both of these or not. Um, and we'll work our way up the tree out. Is well, I like to approach everything a little bit logically, so when I'm when I'm working on trees, I'll tend to do it in a fairly regimented pattern. So for instance, I will I will usually start by cutting off all the old wire and I do just, usually I'll just cut wire and that means that I can then sweep up um, 
just wire off the floor. And I can put my aluminium into the aluminium bucket and I can put my copper into the copper bucket um, for, to be recycled. Um, I'll then remove foliage and then that can be swept up and it's just foliage, so that can go into the compost or wherever that goes and so on and so forth. And so with wiring is much the same, you, you want to start depending on how you're, you're planning on styling the tree. So a tree that's going to have downward branches, so swept down, or branches that have been bent down at the point, um, you would start wiring from the, you would start wiring and styling from the bottom. Um, a tree that's having other branches, like a, a broom style or some more natural deciduous sort of style, um, you would usually start at the top and work your way down. So you might want to have sort of hazard a guess at why you might do it in that one. So if you think about bending something down, okay, as I, as I bend a branch down, it's, it's, well it's creating space above, you're, you're opening up a space to work into. So if you're starting at the top and bending that top branch down, it's going to collide with the branch below before you. Whereas if you're starting at the bottom where you are, you're actually bending one down that creates space to then bend the next one down, that creates space to bend the next one down. And likewise, if you're starting to bend things up, you'll start at the top and work your way. You know, bend it up, create a space below, you bend it up, etc. etc. Et so there's all these little I guess, methodologies or not tricks, but um, ways of working um, that you know, can make a, make a big difference to I guess, the ease of work and, and potentially the quality of the end product. So I have seen some people who pretty much wire everything and then start the place, whereas you sort of work from branch to branch. Yeah, look, I, I do work from branch to branch. It's, um, it, it's sort of one of those things I think you've got to work out how, how you function as an individual. And, you know, are you, yeah, are you with someone who wants to sort of, they can sort of imagine them roughly what they're doing and sort of work towards that in parts? Um, you know, I know there are other people that for, they'll wire all the main lines and then they'll manipulate all the branches and then they'll wire all the secondary and tertiary branches. And your phone. by doing that, they, uh, you know, potentially you can, by doing that top wiring everything, you can then, you don't necessarily have to wire every, every branch because if you move the main line down, these bits of foliage are in the right position in the wall line. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different approaches. I've seen other side people, but particularly there's been a few um, tutors that have come out and they've been very big advocates of wire everything before you've made any cuts. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back and they'll cut off all your wiring that you just put on and then they'll style the tree, which I'm less keen on that, that uh, <laughs> technique. That seems a waste of uh, wire and personal time and all those things. But yeah, I, I think you've certainly got to think about the way you work and the way that you sort of um, you know, your, your own patterns of doing things, you know, it's a classic, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and bonsai is certainly a, a, an example of that. Um, you know, you can, you, you can do, you can get good results through doing a number of different, um, a number of different or similar techniques. You don't necessarily have to do exactly what so-and-so says or what you know, I think the most important thing is that you're very clear on why you're doing something. So, you know, if, you, if you're told that you know, must do it this way, I would certainly recommend that you have a go at it and you think about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and um, is that the way that suits you to get it to achieve, or can you come up with that way? And then, um, you know, I think a lot of the time there's, we've seen out here a number of demonstrators that have run a very much my way on the highway sort of approach. I think that's fine for a workshop, but I think there's so many different ways to, to do things and there isn't really a right or wrong, there's just a way that you know, achieves a good end result or it doesn't mean so you know, that's how you, you get by that. Now, so you sort of see the, the first foliage area starting to come into shape. I haven't really started to prune anything or, or, or do much foliage. Um, Work probably if this was this 
the trail I was working, I would have probably gone through and started to you know, remove some old needles, look to try and get a really even density of foliage across the tree. So usually a tree that's um, been grown out a bit will have areas that are strong and areas that are less strong. And usually the density of foliage reflects that. And so I usually look to try and even that density out across, across the canopy. Um, of course, like I was talking about with that other tree, it's taking six hours to pluck needles and pull off one. Probably I'll you know, see a demonstration of me plucking these needles. So I'll probably do a little bit of that depending on how much time we've got towards the end. Now, the one, um, the one challenging aspect of cedars can be that they can, depending on how, what's removed there, they can be a little bit snappy. Um, and so another, I mean, you know, white pine is probably a superior species in a lot of ways, but it's just, it, shares, it shares that fault. Um, and by snappy, I mean, not necessarily that it will snap, but that it will snap often without warning, and it will snap clean through rather than, um, rather than like a black pine, so if the fibers tear and you'll crack it and you'll rip it apart, but it'll still be held roughly together. These will break clean through like a salary. Um, so, depending on how old the tree is, how fast it's been growing, those kinds of things will sort of all affect that. Um, but it's another, it's another thing to bear in mind, particularly when you're bending things around some finger thickness. Um, they'll often want to, uh, they'll often want to break them, which is suboptimal from the, from the style perspective. And the reason I'm talking about that now is we've hit this branch up here is one that's got that potential. So, I'm going to set up a twitch here. Just try and get away with just wiring the two branches at the very tip. And if you, you won't be able to see this, but you can come up with it afterwards. Um, we've got these two, two branches here. I'm going to wire basically on a specific U shape down one and down the other. Where it meets the trunk here, I've actually run this guy wire up and tucked it under that wrap of wire. And I'll use that as the twitch point to hold the, the, whole, the whole thing together. The way it goes to land. You can sort of, if you watch me mash all these names together under the wall, <laughs> just ignore that, pretend that's not happening. Um, So again, using that twitch, I was contemplating cutting this branch off um, and using the other half of the, the branch that's, or, or this sub-branch I guess, coming off. For fronts through here though, this, this branch actually plays a really nice role and it gives a little bit of foliage on this side of the trunk and a bit of back branch. The other half of the branch actually then creates a bit of depth through this, this <coughs> opening that gets created between the trunk and the first branch, you know, looking through that foliage of that. So, well, I thought I was going to get away with not having to water it and cut it off. It's actually a bit important. Um, it's not a cheeky one, it's not usually all the fingers. Hilarious <laughs> 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 hankies. Yeah, that was nice actually. <laughs> So often when bending like that, um, a lot of the feedback just comes through your hands. Um, so you can feel the branch cracking or complaining and those kinds of things and being strained. And you can sort of use that as a guide when to back off um, or when to stop breaking. And also, you know, you can visually sort of start to see often um, you know, bark separating from you. Um, up the branch towards the trunk. Um, and so they're, they're really good indicators and for that reason a lot of the time I sort of when I'm doing bending like this I won't use raffia. Um, raffia is great when doing really severe work because it sort of holds 
to be like a, it's essentially binding so that whenever it breaks apart, the binding holds it all together. So it might all crack and snap and whatnot. Um, but the actual raffia binding holds it all together and tightly together so that it will just continue to grow and knit together as if, well, not as if nothing happened, but much like nothing happened. Um, so for really severe stuff, raffia is really good, but for sort of this kind of bending, which you know, maybe it's not so severe, um, I tend to like to leave, um, leave it unraffiated and in that way I can actually watch the branch and see what's going on and see where the cracks are appearing and know when to stop them rather than actually cracking it right through and have the raffia hold it all together or sort of stop it before that happens, if that makes sense. Um, obviously if you don't really, you need a really severe bend, the raffia is great because it'll hold it the bind right together. Once you go past that point in over time, the downside with not having done any of this needlework and these plucking is that the branches are really congested with needles, which makes finding a path for the wire to go through near impossible, which is sort of why I'm capturing something. In the water, which it doesn't really harm the tree, it's just not a great, great end look when you come up and look closely at it. But that's a bit of a bit. Okay. So you can sort of start to see the, the branch structure sort of coming together. Um, The, the top of the foliage and the top of this gin are very similar to what there's a minuscule difference. I would really like that to be more of a, more of a difference um, in the height there. So we'll be looking at compacting this apex a little bit as we, we get up to it in order to sort of create that, that um, difference there. I'd also like to get the foliage tucked into here somehow, so whether it's one of those branches or one of these would work that out. As we get on. So the other problem with aluminium, which is sort of is, basically it's as hard, it's as hard a set as it gets the minute you apply it. It doesn't get harder. It doesn't doesn't lock into position. Copper wire, um, when you first receive it, it's been annealed, which basically means it gets picked up so it's whatever degrees cherry red. And cool down, and all the uh, what's the word? Rain. molecules. There you go. All the molecules um, basically change in alignment, so they, they go from either locked together to, to break apart, or vice versa. And what that means is that it becomes very, very malleable. So often, the copper wire will be much easier to bend when it's well annealed than aluminium. What happens during that bending? Though all the molecules then readjust and they align lock together and the wire becomes incredibly hard, which essentially means if you bend a bit of copper wire into one position, it's very difficult then to bend it again. You've almost got to cut off and get wire. Um, the good thing about that is though, that when you've styled the tree, everything's pretty much locked into place. So if you get a strong wind, you get a bird, you bang it as you're getting in and out of the car, um, there's a much greater chance that the copper wire will hold its shape, whereas the aluminium will most definitely have you know, your tips will get bent and destroyed very easily because it stays as soft as it has to be in order for you to apply it. Mm -hmm. So um, Harlan's obviously spent a lot of time preparing that tree over, over quite a few years. Mm -hmm. if, um, if one of the members found a, a cedar or a pine or something at the um, at the November show that they wanted to try and do something like what Han's done. Yes. What, what would you suggest they do? Would they be putting it up? Talk to Han. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why the tree is young? Do they have to be Look, the, the, with any bonsai material, and we sort of roughly sort of hinted at it with that little black like, pine there, the key is movement um, and interest. You know, like you can go to any nursery and get a dead straight 
in material, any nursery, it's really hard to find the ones that have got interesting good So, look, if you're getting a cedar, obviously that's going to be difficult to get. Um, I have other ideas, but, you know, if you're getting stock that's still got a bit of a chunk, just get any movement, anything at all, will be my first step. Um, the next one is allowing things to grow. So in order to, to then get thickness, um, you can only really do that by getting foliage volume. So letting things grow out, grow long, um, and cutting them back regularly so they start dense. Um, and yeah, I, I, they're probably the two, two off the top of my head things that I would be focusing on if I, you know, if I was wanting to develop material or, or develop a tree. If you've got something that's a bit more advanced, um, you know, you, you might be stuck with the actual shape and form of the trunk. So if you are looking for something, look for something that would be interested in the trunk. Um, for the most part, you can massage and manipulate and change branches, you can graft, you can do all this sort of stuff. Very hard to do anything for, you know, for the trunk. So if you can find the trunk, that's half the battle. And then you're left with the other half of the battle, which is getting ready to show. So. <laughs> So, how, how thick was that trunk when you painted? So, uh, that we had been about eight years ago. So, uh, because only one blow went on the bottom, we got all the, on the back one, all the dead already at the top. They're very tall, about two meters high. So, I don't know what, what can I do, you know. Then I put them, you know, the very big rubber hammer. I think pin that the OEC for big proper hammer. I don't know what to do. And then then after that, rock can snap on the top. And then I try to bend again. You know? Usually I want to bend on the wall that more higher. You know, but the nothing point. It got go, go very high, that's why I can't hold it up. Then I bend this one. And it snap the other side, snap the other side. I I don't know, maybe I shouldn't I mean, it, it actually already gone. Now, uh, they still survive for one friend. I just leave it there, and then just leave the quarry, leave the quarry, and it's still like that. And when, when you have done, you know, the test with the car is already, you can't bet anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that Alan said that he snapped it a few times because I've snapped my share of. Um, Particularly other people's cedars at workshops and things, which is always, uh, always a bit hard to explain. But um, yeah, it's one of their one of their vices. They sort of catastrophically fail when they snap. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't like put them off them. They make as we hopefully see tomorrow. Well. They can make really good, good trees in a relatively short time. I think probably the other good the other good point to make, you know, if someone wants to. Develop a good train with so some excellent material turn up to the, the workshops. But you know, bonsai takes time, and the beauty is that you can also buy time in that you can buy stuff that other people have already developed to a certain level. Mm. Um, and that's that would be one of my you know key recommendations if you're looking to get ahead, you know, buy time. And you know, it's bonsai stock can seem expensive, but when you when you think about the investment of time, and mm. you know, even if you do a really dumb calculation on you know, minimum wage on you know, McDonald's wage or something like that, because it's the amount of potential time you'll spend on the tree over the next 20 years, you know, if, if you're working properly, you're spending whatever, water it once a year, six something hours, water it every day for a year, mm. it's that 365 days, you're spending two minutes a day, someone wants to have a crack at those maths. Mm. <laughs> on and on and on, you add all that up, you know, like, Become significant over you know 15, 20, 30 years, how long you're gonna own this tree for. So if you can buy yourself a head start, you know, even if it is you know um, semi fully expensive at the time, the, the benefit in the increased quality of the material, which therefore the increased quality of the end result, um, and the reduced amount of time that it's taking you to get there and actually be able to enjoy the tree and learn, I guess, the skills you learn as you work that bit of material to develop it, you know, on a mature bit of material on a um, development. You mentioned watering every day. Um, yeah. the range, you got to water it then? Probably. Yeah. Um, depending on what's... I haven't watered most of winter. You have? I haven't. You have. I'm in Ballarat, 
and my backyard is pretty sheltered from the wind. Um, wind is probably one of the biggest dryers of quartz, I would say. Heat, heat has its effect, but certainly if you've got a, you add wind to the mix, it just lights things. So even in winter, um, often when it rains, you'll, particularly if you've got a really dense canopy, the, the water will actually shed around it. If you've ever sheltered under a big old tree in a park when it's raining, you know, there's a lot less rain hitting them right at the base than there is at the extremities. So, particularly with ramified trees that are really well dense, um, it's surprising how little water they can sometimes get. I, I've got certain trees that I know if it's can be quite a heavy downpour, and the pot will almost be bone dry afterwards if everything else is saturated, the backyard's flooded, um, and this tree is almost dry. So, yeah, you've certainly got to keep an eye on them. You, you start to get to know what trees need what, um, and also the weights at which you might have to water them. Um, <coughs> some things will be a lot more thirsty than others. Um, but yeah, I mean, someone who might be watering for two or three times a day in your backyard and your walks and things. Given the habit of the tree to um, spring upwards again when it's not wired, that would mean even on a finished tree that fine branches would always need to remain wired. Is that um, right? Yeah, it's all yeah. Certainly long stuff like this, you can sort of see that's, it doesn't really have the ability to support itself in the, in the actual, because it's so flexible. Yeah. Um, and often you get germs like that, floppy tips, whatnot. So the only way you can deal with that is you can let it grow out and cut it back so that it's much shorter to shoot supporting forage on it. So you end up with sort of a dance, denser um, amount of small short twigs yeah. rather than one big long twig. Um, and that starts to sort of help those issues yeah. a little bit. Um, but yeah, yeah, there are there are certain like, other other pine species and things will actually lock in position a lot more readily. And after a much shorter time, might only require a month or two is wire left on. And you know the uh, It'll be locked into its you know, final position essentially. You might not have to worry again for a couple of years. Um, whereas these, you might, you might be you know, just by default having to wire for every year. I mean, that's another. Talks a little bit about how the demands of a, of a particular tree increase as, as it improves in quality. So, you know, let's. A deciduous tree is probably a good example in that, you know, you start off as the branch first gets grown from the trunk. You have one shoot coming out. So over the whole tree, what's an easy number? Let's say you've got 10 branches um, across the whole tree. And the first year they're just single shoots. So you literally have 10 things you have to wire. You've got 10 things you've got to prune, 10 pruning cuts, um, etc. etc. You're only looking at 10 branches. The following year, you know, this is a slow growing deciduous tree, so you've only actually doubled the ramification. But you've now got 20, so you're taking Potentially twice the amount of time to prune. Mm -hmm. Following year, you're doubling that, you've got 40. Mm -hmm. Following year, you're doubling that, you've got so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And then, as that's happening, everything's getting a lot more dense, so you're not able to get your hands in and work on it, so you have to prune a lot more slowly, more carefully, etc., etc., etc. So, the actual time you have to invest in trees as they improve it gets, gets longer and longer. The, the more buds you've got to deal with, the more leaves you've got to cut off, the more this and all that. So, it's certainly something to bear in mind as your collection starts to mature is that the time you had for your, you know, your thousand stock plants or your cuttings or whatever it was, um, you're not going to have that same amount of, well, they're going to, their demands are going to become a lot different, they're going to require a lot more of your time um, as they improve. And I think, yeah, it's a, it's a really important thing in order to, uh, what's the word? To acknowledge that and you know, modify your collection to suit your lifestyle and the amount of time and I guess the quality of material or the quality of water that you're aiming to produce in the long run. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, maybe all you want to do is produce really interesting material, which obviously the material stage, interesting thick little bendy trunks, require probably a lot less work than a finished tree of the same size. There's nothing wrong with doing that, having a heap of those and playing with them, or having a couple of really good trees and then having a lot of material that you're messing around with to get you interested. But I think you, you want to make a real conscious um, uh, what's the word, sort of decision on how, how many trees you're realistically able to keep in the top quality. Mm -hmm. um, so managing collection, calling them. Yeah. It's very hard. <coughs> you know, 
it's, a, it's an accumulation sort of style hobby. You don't want to get invited on one dig out, so when you've got 10 new trails, and you go to a show, you've got 10 new trails. But um, yeah, it's certainly something to keep in the back of your mind as you're walking around your collection. And also just the, the amount of time that you, you're willing to invest in things. You know, I've had trees that, I've, I've had trees that have gone through my hands and um, one of the pines there. You know, they, they were really good bits of material, good trees that stayed well as well as that. They developed really well. Um, but for whatever reason, or you know, next to other trees in my collection, I just didn't excite me enough to really motivate me to work on them much. And because of that, I never really developed to their full potential. Um, in those cases, you know, I, I sold, I sell those trees. Um, and it's a hard decision to come to to sell them, but the minute they're out of the garden, I don't think of them again until they turn up like <laughs> to my years ago. Well, maybe we should hang on to that one or, uh, or whatever. But yeah, so collection management and realistic collection size is a really important one to sort of think about. Yeah. Size would that make a difference? Size of the tree? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So, you know, I don't know, tree this big, I'll take two or three days, whereas in the same time frame, I could do 20 small trees or something like that. So, yeah, you've got to sort of do a bit of an assessment on what you want to grow and how much time you've got and all those sort of things. Like a guy or um, This is sort of where. <coughs> I quite enjoy like, puzzles and those kinds of things, but like, I'm worrying very much <coughs> slots into that sort of side of um, my way of thinking, I suppose, where you really got to look, you know, look at what you're doing and sort of plan a bit ahead in order to get a, a good finish. If you're sort of blindly just whacking wire and whacking wire and whacking wire, and you, you inevitably end up with you know, a, lot of, a messy job of crossing wires, wires that are you know, doing what they're meant to do, holding what they're meant to hold, these kind of so I quite enjoy the, the, the problem solving challenge of getting the wire uh, on the tree and getting it on that you know, word, uh, efficient and accurate and correct way. And I mean, the other one is that one of those rules of thumb you hear about the wiring is wiring very much has right smells. I think styling has uh, styling uh, is a a lot more in the grey area, but this comes out of personal taste and all this sort of thing. But wiring, you know, it has rights and wrongs because it's almost a horticultural technique in a lot of ways. But the crossing wires, you know, by having if anyone's ever put a bandage on their arm, and you put one layer on, your arm's fine, you put another layer on, it gets a bit tired, you put another layer on, it gets tired again, and before you know it, your hands are starting to turn purple. And wiring's, wiring's a little bit the same, you know, when you cross a wire, the first wire goes on, it's permanent. Second wire goes over the top of that, and it, it basically exerts further pressure on the first wire. And you know, if you have any more wire, it comes in moist. But it'll essentially lead to those wires cutting in at a much um, what's the word, advanced sort of rate than they might otherwise. So yeah, that, that's essentially why there's a normal inch in cross wires, apart from cooking um, as well. But a lot of those sort of rules when it comes to wiring are to do with efficiency. You know, anchoring the wire, having, having both ends of the wire anchored, actually means that it'll hold and it'll, uh, <clears throat> it'll uh, go in the, in the direction or, or be able to move into the right um, the space that you're after. The wire that's not anchored basically will twist and swivel and not, not necessarily do the job that it needs to. So starting in, sort of so that the voids getting a bit filled in by those, those branches there. Um, you can now see that the actual fall off its perch. Um, you can now see there's a very clear height difference. Now I guess this is now becoming very much the top of the tree. Um, Um, you know, ideally, I would go through this tree and I'd wire most of the smooth branches. If I was going for a really refined finish, um, you know, you wire everything down to its so last, last little branch. Um, so, anything that's turned into mature wood, and while that's 
Oh, they said not brownish bark rather than the whiter you would probably see it in some of these shoots. <coughs> the, um, the new growth has a sort of white sort of um, mm. fresh look to it, and the other stuff, the older two, two years plus, gets more of a grey sort of bark sort of colour to it. That's the sort of stuff I'll be aiming to wire for the most part, but more mature stuff. Joe, excuse me. Is there a rule of thumb regarding the gin above the the uh, top of the tree? In, in, in what respect? Oh, what what kind of rule of thumb? Do you know? well, well, once I heard that the, the gin should be higher than the uh, actual crown of the tree. Um, Is there any rule on that? Well, first, first of all, I guess who's enforcing those rules? So, um, I think people always say rule. You know, there's, no, no one's going to no one's going yeah, no uh, pull it up. There's no uh, official enforcement agency in the But having said that, you know there, there are sort of rules of thumb. I think I wouldn't necessarily say genes always have to be higher than foliage, but I think when when the apex of the tree is the same height of, as the gin, it sets up this sort of level line. So from a design point of view, you've got these two elements that set up a sort of very static line. And in, a, in an object that usually is very dynamic, you know, bonsai are usually got, got movement or of um, bending and twisting and those kinds of things, to set up those static sort of relationships in, in amongst these dynamic forms creates, um, what's the word, not conflict, but it, it creates a sort of a, a sticking point, if you like, in the design. So, you know, I would, I would sort of say that have one or the other higher is, is an easy way to get around that, um, that sort of juxtaposition of issue. Um, having said that, you know, you might actually find that there's a tree, for whatever reason, whatever style and shape it ends up in, it, it actually needs a, um, it needs that relationship. To be, maybe it's got a lot of horizontal lines within design, so you actually want to set up that. Go for it. So, I'm always very nervous to say rules. I think there are definite do's and don'ts when it comes to wiring, definite do's and don'ts when it comes to horticulture. You know, there's horticulture of science, that's why it's wrong. When it comes to styling, you know, styling is very much a personal thing. You know, if, you're, you, know, if you think bonsai is an art, which some people argue it is and it isn't, um, you know, it's like it's like going to an art gallery, different people get drawn to different objects or different things. You know, some people get into sculpture, some people get into modern art, some people like you know, the Renaissance you know, period, blah, 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 blah. So, styling is very much the same. It comes down to personal taste and your own interests. You know, some people like to be dead wood, flashy trees, or like quite specific trees, etc., etc. So, I think it's very hard in that, in something that is so subjective to come up with, you know, do's and don'ts, all rights and wrongs with styling. You can come up with a basic set of um, guidelines, I suppose, that can give you something that looks like a bonsai. But I think Within those guidelines, there's always an opportunity to break them and go against them if, if you can justify them and understand why. Um, look, to save you all watching me wire a little tiny branch, I'm just going to start plucking and removing this foliage and maybe. Yeah, maybe a couple of things. So, The tree's roughly styled. We've moved all the main branches around. We've sort of formed up you know, a bit of an apex and branches, different levels of foliage. We've changed the height of the apex and the, and the branch here. At the moment, we're going to be It's at the moment. Can anyone sort of see that there's this thing going on? There's no point of so through here. There's a line happening between these bits of foliage on this side and this pad on this side. And a bit like we're talking about if you know if your gene and your apex are the same height. That that to me sets up sort of a, an artificial line within a, a natural or, or an organic sort of form. So I'm gonna look at pulling one side or the other down to set up a bit of um, <coughs> what is it, asymmetry? I'll pull it down. Oh. I was going to say I haven't broke the branch yet, but I don't have to jinx myself at least. Yeah, I don't have to jinx myself just yet. So, now I'm 
can't say. So, now to me, this, this little bit of foliage now is very important. It's the only bit that's really crossing the trunk line and breaking up that sort of flow up the tree into the, into the gym. Um, that will need to be developed out a bit larger of a little bit cheap branch. Mm -hmm. stage in the stock. You know, it would now be at a point where I would like to sit back from it and look at the tree and drink a cup of tea and shift some things around and have more things and look at it. Generally, I guess from <coughs> without sort of getting too much into you know, design and blah blah blah. What I tend to look for in trees, particularly these types of trees, is this space here um, creates sort of a, a window if you like that the eye gets drawn to and if Pull this branch out of the way here and sort of see how your eye goes straight through the tree. That's just so good. So that, that to me, that you can solve that problem with your eye escaping if you like. So the idea is you well, I want to create trees that people look at and get drawn to and look at for a long period of time. If you've ever a really interesting thing to do you can go to an art gallery, it's just sit down and just watch how long people view what you're paying for. And most people are like this. This is a stroll, right? Maybe 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. So the real challenge in a, in a visual thing like this, you know, an exhibition, you've got the same things. And, you know, I think um, also I've got a few other, uh, I guess, draws that, that possibly get people in. But certainly if you can set up a tree that holds someone's eye in it and doesn't allow it to be lost through it or into another thing, you'll actually end up with a much better composition at all. So that doesn't look like it's spot. So, you know, it's constantly looking through from um, looking through the front and trying to pick up these areas and trying to get everything to work in something. So, we move this back branch into that hole, creates, gives you a sense of depth through the tree, um, so it adds to three-dimensionality of the tree, but also hopefully just keeps what is looking at there for another five seconds, ten seconds, whatever it is. Um, Going forward with this tree, um, I think the pot's pretty good. Um, as a container, the size is nice. Um, often you'll see trees with this sort of trunk in much bigger containers. Um, it's pretty good. What story does that tree tell you? Story? Okay, so that's another, that's another interesting thing. So, the way I like to do bonsai, I don't, I'm not necessarily trying to replicate nature. So some people, they want to, um, they see a tree, they become inspired by it, and they want to, they want to copy it in a very literal way, if that makes sense. So they want, you know, it's, the trunk looks this big, and it's got this many branches, it's got this side here. Um, I'm not really into that. I, the way I go about growing bonsai is I like the, I like it from more of a shape, sort of perspective, so I'm much more into trying to get the thing, particularly difficult shapes and forms, to try and get the work as a, as a designed uh, object, if you like. So while I certainly like to, I, I spend a lot of time out in the bush, uh, around Ballarat, particularly with my daughter, um, but I, in this whole thing of natural trees, you know, um, if you go into a pine forest, you, you know, the average tree there is probably would make the worst ponds I've ever had. You know, dead straight, tiny branches at the top. Not really that interesting. The trees I like are the one, but right, this is really, this is crazy ones. It's the ones that go up, I don't know if someone tied a knot in it when it was young or something, but it literally goes up, does, basically turns into this sort of lump about this big, where you can see it swirling around, and then it goes straight up again, so it's this mm -hmm. thing. They're the sort of things that really draw me, and I like the oddities and the freaks and those kinds of things. So, I'm not really about creating a story. And some people will do this thing and they'll just say, well, this is where the rock fell and hit it, and this is where the snow was and it was next to a lake, and these were the ducks nested, and all this sort of stuff. Like, 
I think that's fine. I think that's good. It, it, it's, it's, it's a different way of driving. It's a bit like going to a gallery and being attracted to the, the abstract art versus the Renaissance painting versus the portrait versus the whatever it is. Um, you know, the installation art these days. Um, you know, it comes down to personal taste and what you're trying to do. And I think there's, there's a lot of merit in being able to really well replicate a tree that looks like it's literally a scaled down representation of something other. That's a skill that um, I, I haven't really pursued or I always wanted to pursue, but it's, it's, it's really difficult to do well. Um, and, and likewise with the stories, I'm not really into telling stories. I'm very happy to create something where people will interpret in their own way and put their own story onto it. But yeah, I'm, I'm more about shape and form and, um, and balance and those kinds of things are what I'm interested in. And, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> it doesn't have a story from my perspective at this stage. So you let the tree determine what it's going to be? Or? Yeah, I, I like to just work through the tree and yeah, particularly, particularly trees that aren't, I really enjoy trees that aren't so sort of forthcoming with what they should become. There are, you know, you, there are a lot of trees that are very almost. You can look at it and say, okay, that's that. That has to get there. That goes this time. I got the ones that stump you. And you've got to really think about. Them. A real challenge to get to work. I've got real oddities and those kinds of things. But I also really like really long first branches that no one else does. So um, take <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answered the question. Um, Joe, sorry. Yep. For, for all the grace and the movement, you know, the, the feminine sort of movement in that tree, that, that first gin, is that kind of just stay like that? Just straight and long like that? Ah, uh, is it going to stay like that? It would. It would. It's the straightest bit of wood on the tree. Oh, you Well, yeah. Nearly. Well, Probably so it's. <laughs> It certainly doesn't need to be that long. And I'll just try and get the front going. So from the front, that gin almost comes straight out at you. So it actually visually it's not really that much of an issue in my eye. So if you look through, you can see down that line. Yep. Gym sort of comes straight out. But yeah, certainly it's, I think it could be half its length uh, without too much pressure. Um, this isn't my tree, so I'm a little reluctant to do irreversible damage <laughs> to it. I don't know what Hans plans for that is. Um, the branches will grow back regardless of how much of a cup is. That, that's going to grow back. So I'll leave that there as a decision. <coughs> Needs up in here in this tree. Um, going forward, I mean, it's, it's a really nice tree. I, I would be, I would basically be taking off all the downward growing nerves, cleaning up the branch lines. We talked a little bit at the break, a couple of people, as to how you might, you know, we talked about that I hadn't plucked or done any needlework on this tree. Um, essentially, what I would have done is I would have been removing a lot of these needles that are in between. So the way the seed is growing in little, because they're almost little rosettes. And in the centre of the rosette is a butt. And that butt extends and turns into one of the shoots, which is covered in both needles and rosettes, or butts. Um, if I was wiring this, I would be plucking off all of those needles that are just in between the rosettes. Um, I would also probably be knocking off a number of those rosettes, so any going down, any going straight up, um, any that are too close together. Yeah, on the top, look, Cedars tend to do two things with these rosettes. Some of them will basically every year they grow about a millimetre and won't really extend, and then others will take off the inch shorts, depending on where it is on the tree and what, what sort of mood it's in. Um, so the ones on top, as long as they're kept under control, they're okay. You certainly, and this is not every species, you certainly don't want strong growth on the top of a branch like this. This will get incredibly vigorous and incredibly quickly, and it will draw energy away from the tips, particularly if they're down, and these will die back to this growth. And this way I'm very thick and you get lumps and all kinds of stuff. So stuff on top of the branches, cut short or cut off. Um, these sort of needles in between, uh, we basically 
it wiped off. What I would be looking to be left with is just these little rosettes, and each rosette to roughly have the same volume of foliage on it. So I would look for probably a rosette that's of medium strength, and by that I mean that not the most needles around it, not the least, somewhere in the middle. And I'll be plucking all the strong back to that, and I'll be leaving the weak ones and I've got a couple of needles on them um, alone so they can strengthen the next season. So the idea is just slowing down the vigorous stuff and trying to get everything a bit more moderate across the tree. Um, you'll find then that the process for growing this springtime, your buds will start, you'll start to get these long extensions, um, almost like this. I would let these grow out on just about every seed except one that is perfectly, you know, ramified and ready for exhibition. Um, I'll be letting it grow out till they're you know, six in, five, six inches. Um, it's the usual growth you'll get on a moderately healthy cedar. Is, is that each year? Each year. Let it grow out like this. The minute this starts to harden off, and you can sort of see if you look at the cedar over there, it's got this beautiful fleshy soft growth on it. And that's the new growth. And that will it hasn't yet developed the waxy coating that protects the foliage. Once that waxy coating develops, then I will cut these shoots back really short, so back to one rosette or two rosettes. Um, so what you're doing, you're allowing the tree to sort of stretch its legs, get a bit of vigor going. What that means is if you've ever had a tree that's just been pinched within an inch of its life and the trunk has never gained any girth or growth, it's because it's never growing. If you allow the tree to shoot a bit and extend out, you'll think it's slowly but it'll thicken. Your live veins will start to develop on juniors and things like that. Um, but by letting it grow out and cut back, you're letting the, the vigour and the, the uh, what's it called, the momentum of the tree sort of pick up every year before cutting it back. And that cutback will then trigger back buds and help strengthen the, that inner branch and those kinds of things. Um, you don't want to let these extend too much because, like, they'll start to weaken other parts of the, the branch. So, you certainly want to be cutting it back, but probably towards uh, mid to the end of summer, something like that, um, would be when I'll be. Shorten their shoots. If your tree is, you know, all the branches are in place, all your ramifications are pretty much in place, you just want to find some of the tips. Then, as these, and you can see on the tree over there that's just starting, it's got a few of these really soft, tender things. As these extend, they're actually these really fleshy, soft sort of um, the shoots with all those really soft needles on them. And you literally just give it a slight twist and they break in half. And I'll be breaking it down to you know, very short into a third or something, leaving you know, just a tuft of fresh needles at the bottom. And that will stop them extending any further. It will stop that shoot from thickening any further. And so you'll, what you'll end up there is really fine growth at the tips of all the branches on the, on the ex exterior of the ramification. But by doing that, you're slowing the tree right down and not allowing it to have that growth. You're not allowing it to sort of pick, up its, pick up its running speed or, or whatnot. And so really, you know, that's not a, that's not a particular long-term um, way of growing a tree. If your tree is like that, probably a few rotations of that, that quick pinching will actually make the pads over-ramified, they'll be really dense, and you'll stop getting light to the inner parts of the tree, and then you have to prune down the parts of it, and, and sort of start it off on a um, four-year cycle, five-year cycle or something, where you're the, the branches of the um, So, Ideally a month ago, I'd say. So you want to catch the ideal window is just before your buds start really extending. So if you repot when you've got that really fleshy growth on, um, that fleshy growth because it doesn't have a waxy coating is actually expiring a lot. So if you cut all the roots that are supplying the, the moisture to those shoots, um, you'll basically get a lot of die back in those tips. Um, if you do it just before they start to develop, the new roots will grow as those new tips grow and they sort of even out. The other time you can repot, which is pretty safe, particularly in Melbourne, is um, sort of early mid autumn when, when things have sort of stopped moving but it's still warm enough and the roots are still moving a little bit. Um, you've just got to be a little bit careful between then and the next following spring um, because, like a, a well. Uh, a well grown tree will have this, this pot full of roots occupying most of the soil. Um, a newly repotted tree will have a lot of soil with no roots in it and rooting the moisture. So if you've got that soil sitting there and it's been really damp over winter, you've got a chance of getting some sort of moisture in the root system. So if you are repotting in autumn, it's, it's still pretty safe. You just want to be aware of the, the, uh, 
facility, water content of the soil, and the mix over that um, time period. Um, you could then pretty much replant any other time of the year when it's not in um, that young, fleshy growth. But your after the care becomes more and more and more important as, as you sort of go through those things. So if you're repotting the water model, protect it from frost over winter. Um, if you're repotting sort of summer after the first flush of growth starting off, I will be protecting from sort of extreme hay, um, so getting over about 30 degrees. Um, at least until you start to see signs of new growth. Send it to Tasmania. Send it to Tasmania. Well, they get hot. Yeah, hot and dry. Surprisingly, so. Yeah. 